never fails me all my days i've been held in your hands from the moment that i wake up until i lay my head i will sing of the goodness of god and all my life you have been faithful and all my Of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I know you as a friend. I have sinned in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. The goodness is running after, it's running after me. It's running after me with my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. the goodness of God. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring.
every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to the that there's some stuff going on this week. We know that there's people in this room who have gone through some things, some difficult things, um, some good things. And through all of those things, all of that stuff this week, we continue to praise and we continue to raise the name of Jesus and to say that it is well. And that that is our hope in our hearts and in our souls today is that we can cling to that moment that it is well in our soul. And so we're going to ask that you join and prepare your heart for communion this morning by singing with us, It is well with my soul. When peace like a
guys can be seated. Good morning, everyone. It's better than last week. Room for improvement, however. Have you ever taken God's grace for granted? Yes, we have. Have we forgotten that grace does not begin in us? It is a gift we receive from God. A gift is a treasure given to another as an act of generosity and an expression of devotion. God is the owner of grace, and he is the creator of man. God desired to give man the gift of grace, but sin was the barrier to his generosity, the obstacle which prevented God from expressing his devotion for generations. God's grace was not available to all people. God had a plan to eliminate the sin that kept his grace from humanity. God shared that plan with the people of Israel in the days of Zechariah the prophet. I will pour out on the kingship of David and the population of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look to me, the one they have pierced. They will lament for him as one laments for an only son. And there will be a bitter cry for him like the bitter cry for a firstborn. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. God promised to freely pour out his grace after humidity or humanity had pierced God and lamented God's death. Zechariah noted that the royal family of David and the city of Jerusalem would be witnesses to God's suffering. The future public sacrifice would de demonstrate that God would make his grace available to all who look upon and mourn the God who was slain. Outside of Jerusalem, centuries after Zechariah spoke, God fulfilled his plan. Jesus was pierced on an ugly Roman cross. Grace was poured out on those who lament the death of God's only son. We live as recipients of that gift of grace and gather to celebrate that God removes sin as an obstacle between him and us. The emblems of communion help us to recreate that scene which makes grace available to all people. The bread is a reminder of the body scourged and nailed to that ugly cross, then buried in the tomb. If you have your bread ready, take it with me. The cup is a reminder of the blood that poured from Jesus' body. If you have your juice ready, take it. These elements help us to see the price God paid to forgive our sinful actions. The emblems keep the power of grace fresh. May we never take God's gift for granted. Let's pray. God, may we never take for granted your sacrifice on the cross. At the beginning of each, each week, we set aside this time to reflect on your death on the cross. But may we daily reflect on your sacrifice. Help us each day to be reminded of the incredible price you paid for our freedom. Help us to share that sacrifice in our actions and our words this week with those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to be with you. My name is Brian Moak, and, uh, I, you know, last week... You had my boss here, 
and now you get the scraps in week two. Um, I, I am the vice president of church strengthening with Converge Mid America, and uh, that title in two bucks will get you a cup of coffee. And uh, but uh, I love what I get to do. Um, I I get to get up every morning and help churches just like Highfill uh, be all that God has called you to be. And uh, there's a statistic in America that says 85% of churches uh, are either plateaued or declining. And uh, plateaued, it really for most of them, is just another way of saying declining. And so I get to get up every day and say, what if? What if in Converge Mid America we could flip the script? And what if our churches could be strong and healthy and gospel saturated and multiplying places? And so it's the best job I've ever had. Uh, I've, I was a pastor for 25 years in three different places, and I've been doing this since uh, March of 2017, and uh, it has been the joy of my life. I am married, uh, and uh, actually, she's the joy of my life. Make sure you tell her that. Um, and then I've got two adult kids. I know it, it doesn't seem like I could have adult kids because I'm so youthful, um, but I do, and uh, they're both married. And uh, they're all following the Lord, which I am thrilled, and my wife is thrilled and, and blessed with. But none of that matters, because all that matters is we have a two-year-old grandson. And, uh, I, and again, I know. I mean, how, how can this, a youthful guy like this have a grandson? But uh, I'm telling you what, I'd have skipped kids if I'd have known how good the grandparent thing was. It's the best thing in the world, and uh, he is awesome. So it is just great to be with you and uh, great to have you as a part of the Converge family and uh, I'm looking forward to continuing to get to know you all better and uh, to help serve you in any way we can. Uh, we, we have this pithy statement in Converge that says we're better together and, and we really do believe that and, uh, and so we're glad that you are part of that better together thing that, that we're about for the sake of the name of Jesus. So. Uh, with that, let me pray, and uh, we'll get going. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, your bride, the church. And thank you that even though um, we all don't know each other, um, we are forever connected as brothers and sisters because of Jesus. And so we just praise you, Jesus, for, for who you are and what you did on our behalf. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would continue to meet with us as we worship you. You are worthy of every song we can sing. You are worthy of every prayer we can pray. You are worthy of every word we can speak. And we want to just continue to exalt you and focus our heart's attention on you and be different today because we've been in your presence, Lord. So change us, Holy Spirit. Change our thinking. Change our our, our attitudes and our thoughts, that they would be centered on you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Uh, we just give you this time in your name, we pray. Amen. Well, one thing I didn't say in my little nickel uh, intro is the most important thing about me, and that is that I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And uh, it is what all that means, actually, because... In fact, there's this little football team in Green Bay that is really the best thing ever. Well, don't tell my wife that either. But, um, uh, you know, you can leave Green Bay, but you can't take the boy out of... Uh, you can take the boy out of Green Bay, but you can't take the Green Bay out of the boy. And so I am a diehard Packer fan. Um, and, you know, I mean, yay, Kansas City Chiefs, but who cares? Um, it really all is about Green Bay. And so I think it's only appropriate this morning, as now you have evil intent with me now, is uh, that I begin with an illustration from the greatest football team that's ever been, the Green Bay Packers. And uh, the date was July 1961. 38 members of the Green Bay Packers football team were gathered together for the first day of training camp. And the previous season had ended with heartbreak uh, as, as the Packers squandered a lead late in the fourth quarter and lost the NFL championship to the Philadelphia Eagles. Oh, it's horrible. 
And the players had been thinking about this brutal loss for the entire off season. And now they got together. They were ready to get back to work. Uh, they, they wanted to, to get their game to the next level and to start working on the details that would help them to win that championship. And their coach, Vince Lombardi, well, he kind of had a different idea than the players had. And he began with the most elemental statement of all. And so you'll see on the screen, he had a football in his right hand and he said, gentlemen, this is a football. <laughs> I, I mean, think about it. Lombardi was coaching a group of three dozen professional athletes who just uh, months prior had become, come within minutes of winning the greatest prize that their sport had to offer. And yet he started from the very beginning. And he didn't stop there. Lombardi continued his focus on the fundamentals throughout training camp. As a matter of fact, it was said that Max McGee, their all-star uh, wide receiver, was quoted as saying, uh, uh, Coach, could you slow down a little bit? You're going too fast. And uh, Lombardi supp uh, supposedly cracked a smile. But he continued his obsession. That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Uh, right there. I mean, look at that. That's amazing. It's like a train. I'm sorry, I got totally distracted. Uh, um, anyway, where was I? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about a football team. Important sermonic elements. Um, so, uh, but Lombardi was obsessed with the basics. He was obsessed with the fundamentals. He was obsessed with the things that other teams took for granted. And six months later, the Packers beat the Giants in 37 to nothing in the NFL championship. But it does seem rather absurd that a coach would take these professional athletes, these experts in the field, and get them back to the fundamentals. But Lombardi knew something super important. He, he knew that if he didn't repeat those fundamentals to his players, they would be prone to forget them. And then their execution would be lacking. And here's the connection. God is the ultimate coach. And God wants to make sure that his team never forgets the fundamentals. He says it actually in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 9. He instructs the Israelites with these words. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. And God says, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit down, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. In other words, talk about them all the time. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And you need to ask the question, why did God want them to do all of this? And if you were to continue to read in verse 10 and following, God gives the answer. And he says that he wanted to make sure that they constantly knew that he alone was the source of every good thing that they were going to experience. And without these constant reminders, God knew that his people would forget him. And guess what? He was absolutely right. Over and over in the Bible, we see how God's people would forget the fundamentals. They would become apathetic in their relationship with God, and they would fall away from him. But then God, in his unconditional love, would always restore his people. He's amazing that way. But he would always restore them with consequences. You see, because God disciplined his people, because he wanted his people to know that it was far better for them to just obey him and follow him in the first place. Kind of sounds like parenting a little bit, doesn't it? Well, guess what? God has given us the fundamentals as well, and it's called the gospel. The good news of the life and the ministry of Jesus and how salvation is a gift from him alone. And like the Israelites, we got to repeat the fundamentals as well because we are prone to forget the fundamentals and we are prone to leave the God that we love. But too often we think that the gospel is just for the rookies. 
It's just for the rookies only, the people who just come to faith in Christ, sort of this handbook to say, here's how I come to faith in Jesus. And, and then we move on to the more important things, the, the more complicated plays, if you will. Instead, those of us who claim the name of Jesus, well, we need to repeat the gospel regularly. I would argue we need to repeat the gospel to ourselves every day. Because just like the Israelites, we can forget how good the good news really is. Furthermore, we tend to uh, confine the gospel to a narrative that's found in the first four books of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We know that to be the gospel, and it's true. They are called, actually, the gospels, and we need to read them because they do tell us about the life of Jesus, his birth, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and we need to read them. But friends, God's plan of redeeming people for himself, this good news, was not simply some decision that God made 2,000 years ago or some abrupt change to God's plan. Jesus was, in fact, God's redemptive plan, his good news from the very beginning. So this book, the Bible, the entire Bible, is the complete story of the good news of God redeeming man from sin. From Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end, Jesus is the gospel, and we need to be reminded of it every single day. So this morning, we're going to go through our playbook, the Bible, so that we might see again this plan of salvation through Jesus that's woven through the entirety of Scripture. And some of you, probably most of you are saying, oh my goodness, we're going to be here till next Thursday. I promise that it won't take till next Thursday. Uh, I'm just going to give an overview of God's plan to redeem his people and to see that that powerful reality that you and I were included in God's plan from the very beginning. And so my prayer for us this morning is that we would be reminded again in a fresh way the power of the word of God. It is powerful and it is effective and it is in fact in its entirety the gospel, the good news of Jesus. So let's start at the beginning. Page one, verse one, chapter one of the first book of the Bible, and it says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said, poof, I added that. But really, that's what it was. God said, let there be light. And guess what? There was light. And God said, this is pretty good stuff. He said that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning on the first day. And then God continues to create. He created the water, the sky, the land, the trees, fruit, the sun, the stars, fish, bird, wild animals, livestock, all the gross creatures that crawl around the ground that, that we don't want to touch. Creatures that we can see, creatures that we'll never see. And every single thing that God created, he said, this is good stuff. It pleased him. We're told in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, uh, one of those four Gospel books, that Jesus himself was present during creation, and he even participated in creation. That's pretty cool. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word, that's a capital W, that's Jesus, was with God. And guess what? The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Then on day six of creation, God said this, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Do you see the our, the plural? That's the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It says, let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, all these other things he had created, and over all those creatures that move along the ground. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And it was upon creating man that God no longer said, this is good stuff. This is good. No, now he said, this is very good. <laughs> I am very pleased. We were different from everything else he created. And, and God loved man. And God gave him dominion. That, that is rulership over all that he had created. He gave him every fruit and every plant to eat from. He gave him every, every animal to deal with. He blessed man. He would walk with man in uninterrupted relationship and fellowship. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being in such a situation that you're walking around with God without fear in, in, in total perfection? That's awesome. That's what it was. But then just like three pages into this book, man decides that all of that perfection, all of the blessings that God has given, well, you know what? Eh, it's just not enough. We'd like a little bit more. Man decides he wants to be like God, and so he disobeyed God by eating from one stinking tree, only one in the entire garden that God forbade man to eat from. So, because of this one act of disobedience, this one sinful act, God says, you're out of here. <laughs> and he sent man away from the garden. The earth would no longer be perfect. It would be hard to deal with. It would often cause unfruitful work. There would be pain in childbirth. There would be difficulty in personal relationships. And there would be now, for the first time, this recognized distance between man and God because of this sin. But here's the mind-blowing thing. Instead of just leaving man and saying, how dare you disobey me? You're, I'm done with you. God says, I want to show you my love instead. And so he clothes man. He cares for man he makes him fruitful and, and multiplies him so that there's more people. You see, God's gospel plan is already unfolding just a few pages into the Bible. And here it is. Man sins and God redeems. Well, man pays back God's love and kindness by continuing to sin. Isn't that great? <laughs> Murder is introduced by the fourth chapter of the Bible. And by the sixth chapter in the Bible, sin is so horrible, and the Lord sees how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that everything he thinks about even, all the inclination of his thoughts and his heart was only evil all the time. And so God says, I'm going to start over. <laughs> I, I got I to do a reset here. And he's going to wipe man off the face of the earth. But even then, God in his mercy saves a remnant and a guy named Noah in his family. And he saves a remnant of all these animals that he has created. Why does he do that? Well, guess what? It's the gospel. Man sins and God redeems. God tells this guy named Abram that he's going to make him a father of a great nation. They're going to be God's people, his chosen nation, and he's going to bless them with their very own land that he's going to give them. They're, they're not even going to need to work for it. He's just going to give it to them. And then he shows them. God miraculously rescues his people from captivity in Egypt through a guy by the name of Moses and performs all sorts of miracles to prove his presence with them. I mean, just amazing stuff. As a matter of fact, his very presence is with them every single day in a cloud by day and fire by night. I mean, can you imagine that? Like, we're just walking around all day with this cloud that is God there and this fire at night that's God there. That's what they had. That's, I mean, how, how, how could you not be jazzed about that? Well, the Bible says man repays this amazing gift from God by grumbling. <laughs> grumbling at his provisions, longing for their days of slavery in Egypt, and ultimately they decide they're going to serve other gods. So God punishes man for his disobedience, but... but 
He gives them a way to atone for it. In other words, to make it right, to make right this sin. And it's through a sacrificial system that's created that uses animals without defect, perfect animals, and they're going to be offered as sin sacrifices. They're going to die so that the people's sin would be forgiven. Sounds kind of like something's up. And it sets the stage even further for this gospel, the coming redemption through Jesus. Because you're starting to get the theme now, aren't you? Man sins and God redeems. And God gives his people this promised land that he, that he told them he was going to give them. And he destroys foreign armies in ways that only he can take the credit for it. I mean, after all, there's no other way except God to explain how this little dinky nation called Israel could overpower armies a whole lot greater than them. So man repays this amazing gift from God. How? Well, by marrying foreign women. And by, and by serving those gods and forgetting Yahweh. So God judges man. He brings judges uh, for their uh, disobedience. Man confesses his sin and these judges uh, come to restore the worship and the relationship his people had had with them. And so again, over and over, man keeps sinning and God keeps redeeming. And so again, man in his wisdom decides this is all great and everything, but you know what? God's sovereign rule, your kingship, God, it's not quite enough for us. Uh, we want a king like every other nation has. So God says, all right, you can have it. But here's the problem. These kings are not God, so they're imperfect. And so man continues to fall back into sin and idolatry of all kinds. And as we read scripture, you just get more and more depressed because it's like every time God comes through, you know, man continues to sin. So we keep reading and, and, and God sends prophets to convict man of sin. And these prophets, they call people to repentance. By the way, most of the time we didn't listen, but uh, convicts men of, of their sin and, uh, and then they point toward a Messiah that's going to bring ultimate peace and salvation. The gospel is just continuing to unfold and God never leaves his people. But he decides for now God's people are going to have to become captives to other nations because of their idolatry and their sin. Uh, they they got to learn some things. And even in that, God saves a remnant of his people. Because again, you get the gig. The good news throughout the Bible is that man sins and God redeems. Well, God goes silent. There, there are no new revelations coming from God. No, no new voice of God speaking for, for hundreds of years. And all of a sudden, out of that silence, God starts to speak again. And he decides that he's going to send another redeemer to redeem his people. But this time, it's not going to be a patriarch like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not going to be a deliverer like Moses. It's not going to be a judge like Samson. It's not going to be a king like David. It's not going to be a prophet like Isaiah. This time, the redeemer is going to be God himself. The second member of the Trinity who was with God in the creation of the world, who was with God when God said, let us create man in our image. The perfect son of God would be the savior of the world. The word, capital W, would become flesh. The savior would be like none other. He would be the perfect Adam, the perfect Abraham, the perfect Moses, the perfect David. God would become man to redeem man because when man sins, God redeems and it seems like an awesome plan. But there's a catch to all of it. You see, because God is holy, he demands a sacrifice for sin. We've seen that pattern before. In scripture sin has to be atoned for someone has to die so either we die for our sin or a substitute has to die for our sin but this time the substitute no longer is going to be this unblemished animal that's going to have to be sacrificed and offered over and over for the repeated sin of man 
God says this time, his perfect, unblemished, sinless son, Jesus, is going to be a once and for all atoning and substitutionary sacrifice. Jesus agrees to leave the perfection of heaven that he has enjoyed for all eternity past. Think about that for a minute. To become this. <laughs> to become flesh with all of its weaknesses, with all of its limitations. Why? So that he could die for rebellious and sinful people whom he loves. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, You see, at just the right time when we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why? Man sins, God redeems. You see, it was at the cross that the perfect died for the imperfect. It was the death of the holy for the unholy. It was the death of God for man. I've been asked and even thought myself over the years, I mean, how in the world could the Jews have missed all of this? I mean, with so much history of God redeeming his people, how could they have missed it? Not only missing it, but actually choosing to crucify this redeemer, Jesus. I mean, in three years of ministry, Jesus performed at least 37 different miracles. He turned water to wine. He provided bread and fish to feed thousands of people. He healed sick people. He cast out demons. He even rose dead people to life. I mean, even upon his arrest, his captors, the people who were arresting him, watched him reattach the ear of, of one of the soldiers that one of Jesus' disciples had cut off. I mean, that's pretty cool stuff. How, how could they have missed all of that? Some Bible scholars suggest that there are more than 300 prophetic scriptures completed in the life of Jesus. And so that means that hundreds of years before Jesus was born, prophets talked about his coming. In other words, Jesus was the plan from the beginning. He'd be born of a virgin. He'd be born in Bethlehem. He would spend a season in Egypt. He'd be a Nazarene. He would be betrayed. He'd be spat upon. He'd be crucified with criminals. And the list goes on and on and on. And you just have to say, how could they have missed it? John 12, 37 to 40 says, even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. Because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. Simply put, they missed it because God had a plan. And that plan includes you, and that plan includes me. I mean, wow. But we know that the cross isn't the end of the plan, right? We know that the cross is not the end of the story. We just celebrated it a couple of weeks ago. That after three days, in the, in the biggest miracle of all, Jesus rises from the dead. The stone is rolled away from the tomb. Death and sin has been conquered. And so just as Adam's one sin brought condemnation for all of us, Christ's one act of love brings life forever to all who believe. That's awesome. And then after showing himself to hundreds of people, the risen Jesus was ascended to heaven where he was and he is glorified. The lamb that was slain is now the lion of Judah and he's reigning as king of kings and lord of lords. And if there was ever anything that deserved an amen, that's it. Amen. Right. And that brings us to the end of the book. I told you it wasn't going to take all day. 
We're told that one day, the Bible says that maybe even this day, King Jesus is going to return and he's going to establish his kingdom forever and ever and he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth and it's going to be an earth and a heaven without sin and without death, without sickness, without COVID, without pain, without poverty, without riots, without all of the violence that we see once and for all. He defeats Satan and all his demons and why does he do it? You get the gig. Man sins and God redeems. So today, just like that, today we have in this book everything that we need. And the Bible is God's full plan of redemption. There's nothing missing. Nothing. A third of the world claims some belief that Jesus is who he says he is. Most of you sitting in this room today, most of you that are watching online believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Yeah, I can believe that. I can buy into that. But if it's true, if Jesus really is who he is, then why even today will some of us decide, you know what, I'm just not, I'm just not going to get into it. I'm not going to turn my life over to him. Why are some of us even today going to reject God's gift of redemption, the gospel? I don't get it. Well, maybe I do get it. Because sometimes we think, you know what? I don't want to turn my life over to someone else. I want to be in control of my life. Maybe we still don't think that God's enough. Maybe I can add him to my life, but I don't want him to be my life. Maybe we're just not sure that this God thing is really the right thing. I got to investigate some other stuff first. Maybe we feel we're good enough. We don't need God. Maybe we feel like we're so not good enough that there's no way that God could forgive someone like me. Maybe we need some more evidence somehow to, to believe that this is all real. Or maybe the worst is that we just don't think at the end of the day it makes all that much difference. Jesus said in John 14 verse 6, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Friends, the evidence is clear. The difference is clear. God has had a plan to redeem his people from the very beginning, and all along his plan has been Jesus. Why? Because he loves us. He loves you. So what are you going to do with this plan? Are you going to continue to live in rebellion? Somehow that's going to change and work out better for you? Are you going to continue to reject the truth of Christ? Are you going to continue to investigate other roads that somehow you think is going to lead you to redemption? Hebrews chapter 3 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. See to it that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Today is the only day that you have. It's the only day you're guaranteed. Today is the day for you to accept the gospel of Jesus. There's a whole lot of us here this morning that have accepted the truth of the gospel. We've signed up. We say we're all in. So my question for us is, is it still life-giving? Is it still the best news ever? Is the truth of the gospel changing the way that you live each day or are you like, uh, like the Israelites prone to wander, prone to forget God and his power in the gospel? 
And maybe most importantly, if you said yes to all of that, yes, it's the best news ever, yes, it changes the way I live every day, then are you sharing that good news with others in your sphere of influence who do not know this good news of Jesus? Do you even have people in your life that you have a relationship with that gives you the permission to make that uh, share with them? Maybe the most convicting passage for me in all of Scripture comes from Romans chapter 10, verses 13 and following, and it says this, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Boom, isn't that great? Period, end of sentence. That's awesome. But here's the convicting part. How then can they call on the one whom they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And, and how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You and I are the preachers. You don't need a seminary degree to be the feet of them that bring good news. God is saying, each one of us who claim the name of Jesus are the feet of those who bring good news. There's a website called thearda.com. Uh, it's the Arda, A-R-D-A. -A. It's an acronym that stands for the Association of Religious Data Archives. And it's as dumb of a website as you can think based on that name. It's very boring. Uh, however, there's a really cool part of it, and that is this one little space where you can put in your zip code, your city, your county, and it will tell you the religious makeup uh, of your county. It always defaults to the county. So you guys are in Montgomery County. I did a little research. You know, High, High Hill, the city of High, or the town, the, the, the little neighborhood of High Hill, uh, you, you all don't have a lot of people in High Hill. Um, Montgomery City, there ain't, there ain't a whole lot of people in Montgomery City. Um, but I'm telling you what, you have a, you have a mission field. <laughs> there, there, there are a lot of people in Montgomery County that are in the sphere of influence of High Hill Christian Church. In, in Montgomery County, it's, it says that there are 5,500 people who claim some sort of religious connection. Now that doesn't mean an evangelical religious connection. It doesn't even mean a, a mainline or Catholic Christian um, religious association. It means any sort of religious association, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever it is, um, 5,500 people in Montgomery County claim some sort of religious connection. There are 6,500 people in Montgomery people who have no claim to any religious connection at all. 6,500 people, over 55% of your county says, I'm not signing on any dotted line. I don't buy into any of it, or I just don't know about any of it. Barna just came out with a, a statistic that says for the first time in American history, 47% of Americans have some sort of religious connection, just kind of like what I was just talking about. So for the first time in American history, a minority of Americans claim some sort of religious connection. Montgomery County is proving the statistic. 55% of people are going, at, at, and many more than that, are going to a Christless eternity because they don't know what you know. They don't believe what you believe. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I say that, family of God, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. We need to constantly be reminded uh, uh, that of what we've been saved from. Do you realize that not only do you have an eternity with Christ in heaven, but you have a fulfilled and whole life today as well? Because of that grace, because of Jesus, because of the gospel. And there are all sorts of people going to a Christless eternity in hell because they don't even have a clue about what that is. We need to preach it so that we can share it with others in our sphere of influence right now, in our, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. We, we need to share that good news of Christ so that they too would know that it is the best news ever. That's why you exist as a church. You're not a country club for healthy people. You're a hospital for sick people. People who need to know 
the love of Jesus. And I am so excited to link arms with you all for that purpose. I'm just telling you right now, there is no hope in a political party. I don't don't care what party you affiliate with. It ain't going to work. And guess what? There is no hope in this country called America. I love America. I'm a card-carrying American. There, There ain't no hope in America. There's no hope in anything. There's no hope in a vaccine. It's still, we all have a death sentence. There's no hope in a vaccine. I, I have, I'm, I'm getting my second vaccine in a week, so I'm getting the vaccine. So I'm not saying don't get a vaccine, but there's no hope in it. There's only hope in one person, one thing, and that's Jesus. He is everything. He's everything to me, and he wants to be everything to you as well. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I'm so grateful for your grace. (laughs) Undeserved favor. God, I don't don't understand your plan. I, I would never have done it that way. But your plan is perfect. Your plan provided a way that each of us can come to you and know you and live for you and be secure in you, not only uh, for now, but throughout all of eternity. God, one day, those of us who know you will be uh, in heaven with you and, and there will be a day when there will be a new heaven and a new earth. God, we, we, we've got this really warped idea that somehow heaven is sitting on a cloud playing a harp. I, I, I want no part of a heaven like that. It's not true. Heaven is forever in your presence, in perfection. Working and playing and living in perfection forever. The restoration of all that we broke. God, I can't wait for that day. I pray that you would would make us hunger for your eternal home, our eternal home. And Lord, for those in this room and and those online who say, "I, I just haven't done what you've been talking about today. I haven't signed that contract with you, Lord. Your word says that if we believe in our hearts, that Jesus is who he says he is and we confess with our mouths that he is Lord, that, that he's in control of our lives, that we will be saved, period, end of story. There's no magic prayer to pray. There's no uh, penance we need to do to figure it all out. We just need to believe. And we need to transfer ownership from, uh, from darkness to light, from us to you of our lives. And we will be saved and everything changes and the adventure begins. We spend the rest of our lives trying to be more and more and more like Jesus. And so God, I pray this morning, if there's anyone who hasn't prayed that, if there's anyone who hasn't given their lives to you, that this would be the day of salvation. That they would say, Jesus, I'm yours. I know that I have fallen short of your glory. I I know that. I know that I sin, but I know that you paid the penalty for my sin. I believe it in my heart and I confess it now with my mouth that you are all of those things. And I want you to rule my life. I want you to own me. And I want you to to, to be the one I live for from here on out. Oh God, that you would do that today, this morning. For those of us who know Christ, I pray that you would protect us from wandering. Holy Spirit, remind us that you are active in our life today. That you are convicting us of sin. That you are encouraging us when we're discouraged. That you are our conscience. You are our comfort. You are our guide. You are pointing us to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You're not sleeping. You are alive. I pray that we would live each day on fire for you. I pray that High Hill Christian Church would be on fire for you like never before. 
I pray that we would go to the restaurant after church today and the server would say, where in the world have you been? You look different. And we can say, we've been at church. We've been with Jesus and he's done everything for me and I want to tell you about it. Come with me. God, may we look and be different people because of what you've done for us. We love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to invite you to respond with us to that. And if you are in a place where you need some prayer or you need um, to speak to someone, we're going to invite you to stand, everybody to stand um, and move into a time of worship and response. But if you need that, you're more than welcome to come up front. You can go into the back. There'll be people that can talk with you. If you're online and you're um, needing that as well, we just ask that you drop us a comment, send us a message. Someone will reach out to you so that we can be praying with you and that we can be walking alongside you in that journey. So we just ask that you'd stand with us. Um, take your heart, and your mind, and your soul in this moment. And um, be reminded of all that Christ has done for us and respond in whatever way you need to in this moment. If my heart is overwhelmed and I cannot hear your voice, I'll hold on to what is true. Though I cannot see, if the storms of life they come and the road ahead gets steep, I will lift these hands in faith. I will believe. I'll remind myself of all that you've done and the life I have because of your son. set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high or valley low, I sing out, remind my soul that I am yours. I am forever yours. comes my way when I feel your hands of grace rest upon me staying desperate for you God staying humble at your feet I will lift these hands of praise I will believe I remind myself of all that you've
today, I'm going to blow some of your minds. At least once in your life, you've probably heard a someone or heard someone reference Luke chapter 6, verse 38, as they were about to receive their offering in church. Let me read it to you now. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured out into your lap. For with measure you use it, it will be measured to you. The application seems simple, right? Give, and God will bless you with more. Well, it doesn't work that way. The passage is not actually talking about money at all. Rather, it's teaching about forgiveness. It's teaching and letting me read this verse again with some more context. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with this measure you use, it will be measured to you. That's Luke chapter 6, verse 37 and 38. I think our misinterpretation of this verse says something about us as a culture. It's very easy for us to get so consumed with the idea of financial success that we, try, that we twist God's word to say what we want it to say. I believe God will bless others for their generosity, but I also know that this blessing doesn't always look like the dollar bill. Sometimes the blessing God gives through a relationship or even the character change that happens in life when we surrender up to his will. Either way, we can be confident that God has already given us more than what we deserve through his son Jesus. Today as we take up the offering, I'm not going to promise you that it'll make you rich, but I will promise that when you live a generous life, God is pleased by your obedience. Your praise and self-sacrifice is beautiful. It is beautiful to our Heavenly Father. If you've given online, thank you. You can give online by visiting highhillchristianchurch.org slash give. You can also mail a check to 852 Boonslick Road, High Hill, Missouri, 63350. Let us reflect on this as we pray. God, today, we want to be obedient to your word by putting you first. As we give today, we do so out of obedience and with a grateful heart. We are so grateful for all the blessings you've given us, including the ability to give generously to your work here and to those around us. Use what we give today to change lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Hey, uh, Converge Mid-America is our mission giving partner for the month, and we are so grateful to have Brian here with us today. 
I am personally grateful for the encouragement and support uh, that he and the rest of the Converge family has provided for me personally and my family. Uh, and we are so grateful for their partnership as we work to start and strengthen churches. Uh, so every time you give here, a portion of that goes to Converge every single month uh, to help them continue with that. Well, a couple things I'll let you know about. Uh, first, if you have any doubt that our church is growing, all you have to do is step into this classroom right next door because it is full to the brim as you can hear them screaming and playing, ready for us to wrap up service. Uh, our church is growing and God is definitely moving and we want you to be a part of that. There's lots of ways that you can get connected. If you look on your bulletin, uh, we're going through a version plan, plan um, on prayer, so you can scan that QR code and read along with us as a church. We also have several connection groups. We have a Monday night connection group happening online uh, at 7 p.m., and then we have a Wednesday night women's connection group uh, at the house next door here at the High Hill campus uh, at 6.30, and a Wednesday night connection group that's a mixed group uh, going through the book of Isaiah at 7 p.m. here at the High Hill campus. A couple other things to point out in your bulletin. We have a Love Out Loud opportunity coming up in May, uh, which is a Red Cross blood drive. We have men's breakfast coming up. Uh, we have family ministry summer life calendars at the family ministry hub. Uh, and then grad Sunday, if you have a graduating senior or graduating uh, college student, that is coming up in May as well. We're really excited um, about who's preaching that day. Uh, so it's going to be a really good Sunday. Uh, the other thing I wanted to let you know about is uh, we've been giving you updates on the Yes, I Will campaign. Many of you know, have seen on Facebook, um, over the last few months, we've lost a lot of channels on our soundboard, the output channel and uh, several different channels. We've been having a lot of technical difficulties. If you're joining us online, you know that uh, very well. But thanks to your generosity, uh, we were able to install this week a brand new soundboard. Uh, so back at the tech booth here at the High Hill campus, we've installed a new soundboard which will greatly reduce uh, a lot of the technical issues we've had and allow us to continue to reach people both here at High Hill and beyond. Uh, the last thing I want to let you know about is uh, many of you know that the Johnsons are moving. And so uh, if you don't know the Johnson family, they have been a part of our church for a long time and they have helped out in so many ways. And they're such an awesome family. And uh, we want to invite you to help them move. Uh, so if you're available on Monday at 9 a.m., we'd love to invite you to go to the Johnson's house and help them load boxes and furniture and all that fun stuff um, in the trailer, in, in the trailer um, with them. But, but beyond that, we also want to take a moment to thank them and pray for them. So if you guys can come on up here, I think our elders are going to uh, spend some time encouraging and praying for your family. trying to remember 2007 is that about right when you moved here 2009 <sighs> we just love this family they they've uh they've done a lot <laughs> they've done so much for this church um they've served so much we've watched their kids grow and uh, become followers of Christ, and we're going to miss them. You know, the good thing is, though, they're still part of the family. They'll always be part of our family. And we just wanted to send them off with a blessing from God. Um, even though our hearts are heavy, we're excited for what God's going to do in their lives. And so would you just join us as we, as we pray for them? Dear Heavenly Father, we just lift up Reed and Natalie and this whole family, the Johnson family. Father, the blessing they have been to High Hill, how they have servants' hearts, how they have served you uh, in a way that is an example to all of us. And Father, we're going to miss them. Um, they're going to be a short drive away, but Father, we, we're excited for what you're going to do in their lives. So Father, we ask 
that you would continue to bless them as they serve you. Father, that you would bless this new job, this new house that they will call a home, this new community. Father, that you would show favor to them in this world, that you would uh, pour your blessings and continue to pour your blessings out upon them as we know you will. Uh, Father, um, again, uh, it's with heavy hearts that we come to you, but Father, again, we know you are such a good God, and we know that that they are in your hands. So Father, as we send them off today, Father, just pour your blessings out upon them. Father, we love you and we love them in Jesus' name. Amen. Since uh, Kent ended the prayer, I'm, I'm, I was going to say that this family, <laughs> they've, been a bless- they've been a blessing to me. I think they've been a great blessing to our church. God has blessed us so greatly. And watching these two young men grow up gives me tremendous faith in the future of the church. And I commend you two for doing such a great job and raising these wonderful kids. And we are going to miss you. So we do thank God. We appreciate everything the, this family has done for us. They've done for more for us than we've done for them. So uh, I, I think Ken said we're going to miss you guys. There's going to be a, a definite hole in our family. But we know God has got bigger and better things for you all to do. Uh, And we hope as a family we have prepared you for this as elders of this church. And so may we bless your endeavors. And and may God bless you with friends, a church family there, that would be as good or better than ours. We love you guys. everybody. Oh. Friends, we uh, ask you as you guys are heading out this afternoon, I think it's almost noon, um, to go ahead and uh, stop and send them well wishes and, and hugs and prayers and all of your good feelings today. Um, we are going to sing one more song just to stand up, get some joy, um, and celebrate the message that we heard today and the incredible news that we heard and how we can share that out. And so we're just going to share that good news. We're going to celebrate and sing as we head out our door. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God We serve an awesome God. Thank you for being here today. We'll see you next time. God bless. Have a great week.